Are you ready to be the ultimate Pokemon Master Trainer? Then join the Pokemon Trading Card Game League. You'll do awesome activities, learn wicked strategies, earn cool trainer badges, and meet new friends as you begin your journey to become a Pokemon Master Trainer. To find out more about the Pokemon Trading Card Game League, log on to wizards.com. Go forth and be a master. In January 1999, the Pokemon trading card game debuted in the U.S. with the release of Base Set. Stores couldn't keep the product on the shelves, as fans rushed to open packs and pull their favorite Pokemon. But as these fans opened more and more boosters, they began to realize this wasn't just about pulling their favorites. There was a game behind these cards. I'm the Ruby Retro Historian, and this is the story of the first era of competitive Pokemon. Simply named Base Set, Pokémon's first set contained 102 unique cards, featuring 69 Pokémon, 26 trainers, and 7 types of energy. What's exciting about this first era of Pokémon is that cards from subsequent expansions breathe new life into Base Set upon release, so many of the cards players first focused on were not the ones that later would become power cards, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's first look at the important cards that made up the base set only format. Each of the three starters received cards with powerful attacks and Pokemon powers. Venusaur could deal a reasonable 60 damage and was able to move your grass energy around to maintain a steady stream of attackers. Charizard dealt massive damage and didn't care what type of energy was attached to it thanks to its power. But the best was Blastoise, with its iconic Rain Dance ability to continually dump water energy onto your Pokémon. Other iconic cards included Alakazam, which wasn't for attacking, but moved damage around on your Pokémon. Chansey, with its massive HP and playability with double colorless energy. And Zapdos, which like Charizard dealt massive damage for a basic Pokémon and synergized with Electrode's Bazap power to fulfill its large energy costs. Players were no doubt excited to see some of their favorites given a chance to succeed in gameplay. However, they quickly realized that these cards paled in comparison to two Pokémon who would prove to be the kings of the base set format, Hitmonchan and Electabuzz. At first glance, Hitmonchan is such a simple card. Jab does 20 for 1 fighting energy, and Special Punch does 40 for 3 energy, neither with an effect. But when few basic Pokémon had more than 50 HP and were attacking for 10 for 1 energy cost, Hitmonchan proved more aggressive and efficient. Though weak to fighting types like Hitmonchan, Electabuzz dealt 10 damage with Paralysis Chance for 1 lightning energy, and could deal 40 for only 2 energy. Again, Electabuzz was everything Hitmonchan was, aggressive and efficient with both having 70 HP. Their one energy attack cost made it easy to splash both in the same deck and leave room for the plethora of trainer cards base set gave us. Speaking of trainer cards, base set gave us all variety of strong ones. Each could be played during your turn without restriction, other than the printed cost because trainer types, like supporters, did not yet exist. Staple rares included Computer Search, which gave the player unlimited access to the deck, and it was so strong that it was later reprinted as a one allowed per deck card. Item Finder, that allowed the player to get back key trainer cards later in the game. Lass, which disrupted both players' hands by removing all their trainer cards. And Super Energy Removal, that removed two of your opponent's energy cards for the cost of one of yours. That's balanced, right? Other powerful cards included Scoop Up to pick up damaged or hard to move basic Pokemon, 
Pokemon Trader, which functions like Pokemon Communication, trading one revealed Pokemon for another, and Pokemon Breeder, the precursor to rare candy that let you skip a Pokemon's middle stage. Next, the Uncommon Trainers, featuring the all-powerful Professor Oak that allowed you to discard your hand and draw seven new cards. Defender and Plus Power modified how much damage you dealt or took. Energy Retrieval recovered energy cards lost in your opponent's barrage of energy removal cards. What may surprise a lot of modern players is that many powerful cards were commons. Bill allowed you to draw two cards for no drawback. Trading one card for two is incredibly powerful on its own, but when you can play Bill only to draw another Bill and keep the train going, now that's incredible. Also strong is Energy Removal, which removed an energy attached to an opposing Pokémon for no cost. When you consider during the game's history that people played the coin flip version of this card, you know this was too powerful. Continuing with the theme here, Gust of Wind was a no drawback means to attack weaker benched Pokémon that worked automatically, no flip required. Lastly, we have the most obvious effect in the set, Switch. Notably, there was no great way to recover Pokémon in this era, only trainers and energy cards. Though Revive could grab back Pokémon, it only targeted basics and cut their HP in half when revived. This simply was not worth the deck space. Back in these days, Dark, Steel, and Fairy RIP, didn't exist yet, so the only basic energy cards players had to work with were Grass, Fire, Water, Lightning, Psychic, and Fighting. Rounding out base set was the classic double colorless energy card. The first decks contained a similar spread of powerful trainer cards combined with Pokémon like Electabuzz and Hitmonchan as their attackers. There is no doubt that players quickly realized that these were the best Pokémon to run, and results from the time indicate that. Now, I want to be very clear, these lists are anything but refined. Many decks ran over 20 energy cards. It's easy now to look back at modern decklist repositories like Jason Klasinski's blog or PTCG Archive, both linked in the description below, and laugh at how bad we were back then and how obvious good lists should have been. But you have to remember, this was early on in the game. Players only had had cards for a matter of months. Most were playing with what they had cracked from packs. Limited game knowledge and supply of cards definitely showed these early months. But part of the fun of card game history is seeing lists as they were created and improved, and metagames as they developed, not our modern takes on them. With that in mind, let's take a look at some decks from the era and how they progressed. Early on, players were still experimenting with cards other than Hitmonchan and Electabuzz. A look at killer reports on Pojo from early 1999 indicates players were willing to try just about anything during the game's first months, even trying to make cards like Beedrill and Ninetales work. One of the earliest decks players caught on to was Raindance. William Hung, yes, the William Hung from American Idol, took home first place at an April 1999 tournament with his Raindance deck featuring Gyarados. A similar list took home another tournament around that time as well, and there are reports of Raindance decks popping up with Dugong in place of Gyarados because Seal had more HP than the lowly Magikarp. However, Dugong suffered from the same issue players would associate with Blastoise, a weakness to Lightning, and you know what that means. <laughs> Gyarados was actually the safer option, given its grass weakness, that is, if you could avoid losing turn 1 from a carp start. Haymaker was the undisputed best deck. The combination of Electabuzz and Hitmonchan was just too much for most of the early format to handle. A lot of the early lists played around with the cards used. Finding success in countering other Haymaker decks with psychic type attackers, like the variant running Jinx. Players would also experiment with including Mewtwo to try and take advantage of Hitmonchan's Psychic-type weakness, but this was soon dropped in favor of more consistent builds given the lack of energy search and format to find that third energy type. For the most part, players stuck to playing four copies of Hitmonchan and Electabuzz, 
around four total copies of Farfetch'd and Doduo to resist opposing Hitmonchan's jabs with minus 30, as well as the high HP Chansey to tank several hits from Electabuzz. As you can see, the only real variety in these lists are the trainers that were run, but that's honestly more of a symptom of limited access to cards than it is with players trying to get creative. Now, it may come as a shock to players that the famed Mulligan Mewtwo was not actually a viable deck. The premise was simple. Continue using Barrier until your opponent decked out before you did. The issue? Well, a lot of smart players were running energy removal. From what I can find, this deck, while rumored, had absolutely no success during this time. Outside of Raindance and Haymaker, a lot of the decks early players focused on just wouldn't have been viable had the tournament scene been more fleshed out. I don't think players running Alakazam and Venusaur in the same deck, or Magneton backed with Psychic Attackers were going anywhere fast in this era. Again, a lot of this is just a result of the limited card supply and lack of a singles market at the time. That said, it's really exciting to see players, even from the game's earliest days, being so willing to push the boundaries of the meta and try whatever cards were in their binders. Thankfully, in revisiting this format, Jason Klasinski has presented a few additional archetypes that, while not totally viable against Haymaker, are certainly better positioned than a Gyarados Ninetales deck, or whatever that conglomeration of cards was meant to do. The Zapdos focuses on loading the board with Electrode that KO themselves to attach as a special energy card to Zapdos that provides two of any energy type. Hit opponents with last to take away their removals and mow down opposing low damaging Pokemon. Alakazam Gyarados focuses on stalling the opponent out, moving damage around the board and consistently healing with Pokemon Center. Alakazam Machamp does something similar, but focuses on dealing damage from time to time via Machamp's ability. So you can stall and ping them straight into submission. Unfortunately, all of these decks suffer from running a lot of low HP Pokemon, making them easy prey to Haymaker and its quad plus powers. So it makes sense that early players gravitated so heavily towards the Haymaker archetype. Hitmonchan and Electabuzz were meta-defining in the game's first few months, but that would all change in mid-June 1999 with the release of the first expansion set, Jungle. Jungle is one of the smallest expansions in the game, offering only 48 new cards. Wizards of the Coast, who distributed the set in the US, made all rare cards have non-holo alternate arts just to increase the set size to 64. What Jungle lacked in size, it made up for in its impact to the meta. No new energy cards debuted in the set, and the only trainer was the iconic Pokeball, so what made this set so important? Scyther a 70 HP free retreater with an attack able to utilize any energy type, especially double colorless, was incredibly strong. But Scyther's biggest asset was its fighting resistance, allowing it to completely wall opposing Hitmonchans and slow the Haymaker onslaught. In the same vein, Mr. Mime also slowed the game down, forcing attackers to deal no more than 20 damage to it or else deal no damage at all. While Meditate could take a bit to deal big damage, its invisible wall power ensured it would remain safe until then. Comboed with the previously useless Potion card, Mr. Mime could stay around for some time. And maybe even turn into Mr. Rhyme. Oh wait, wrong generation. Jungle was notable for completing some of the evolutionary lines missing from base set. For example, base set contained Ponyta, but no Rapidash. While not amazing, Ponyta and Rapidash gave players a Fire-type attacker to counter opposing Fire-weak Scythers for the cost of a mere double colorless energy. Jungle also contained the first Clefable card, breathing new life into Clefairy from base set. 
using Metronome for one energy would prove incredibly strong against Pokémon requiring multiple energy to deal big damage. Kangaskhan gave Alakazam decks a big HP Pokémon other than Chansey to move damage to with Damage Swap, and Kang doubled as a great starter with its Fetch Attack to dig deeper into the deck. But these colorless Pokémon paled in comparison to the other meta-defining card from the set, Wigglytuff. Though weak to fighting, and a slower Stage 1 attacker, it featured easy-to-power-up attacks due to their colorless cost. Wigglytuff also reached damage numbers only previously achievable for big energy costs or on Stage 2s. Fill your bench and you're dealing 60 damage, keep adding plus power, and the only Pokémon you can't KO are Charizard and Chansey. Interestingly, some of the best cards in the set were overlooked back in 1999. Jason Klasinski notes that players missed the potential of Dodrio to continue cycling between attackers, as well as Lickitung, one of the best Pokémon in these early sets. Though weak to fighting, its 90 HP demanded Haymaker find a plus power to deal the additional damage needed to take Jab or Special Punch KOs. It also made for one of the best early ways to stall players to deck out with its Tongue Wrap attack. Forcing players to dig for their switch cards while paralyzed in such a grindy, slow Scyther-based format would have proven powerful. Even though our friends Dodrio and Lickitung didn't quite make it into deck lists at the time, we have some good variety to go back and look at. Shortly after the release of Jungle, Kevin Wynn took down a tournament with his Raindance deck, going 6-0. It ran a Tech 1-1 Clefable line to catch opposing players off guard, and looked to capitalize on Haymaker's low damage output mid to late game by running Super Potions to heal away 40 damage for the cost of one energy. Add in lots of consistency cards and removals, and this deck looks pretty good. The one strange thing is that the deck lacks Pokémon breeders, instead opting to run a thick Wartortle line, perhaps so he wouldn't have to dig early on to find Breeder and Blastoise in the same hand. At the same tournament, a master side event was won by Haymaker player Andreas Rodriguez. What was notable about his deck was that it completely cut Hitmonchan in favor of Scyther, signaling where deck building during this era was headed. While the many other choices in the list are a bit suspect, like running 24 energy, or still running Farfetch'd, it's clear Andreas read the room and knew Scyther was the best way to counter opposing Haymakers running Hitmonchan. A few weeks later, another Haymaker deck took home a local event, again opting to cut Hitmonchan entirely for Scyther. Looking to try and utilize Scyther's Sword Stance attack, the deck had a heavier focus on grass types, even including the seldom used Nidoran male from base set to try and hit heads to deal big damage. While Pokémon still didn't have an official tournament scene, Gen Con ran a rather large Pokémon tournament that year. Tyler Grun took home both the Saturday and Sunday tournaments with a teched out Haymaker list, running Jigglypuff to deal with Mr. Mime, yet running no Wigglytuff. He also leaned heavily on card advantage, running Kangaskhan as well as max counts of both removal cards. Clearly he knew what this format was all about. As the summer went on, decklist turned into what many players will undoubtedly recognize as the iconic, or cookie cutter, Haymaker Trio of Hitmonchan, Electabuzz, and Scyther. Results from events demonstrated that players recognized this offensive core as the keys to any viable deck. Instead of making separate decks around Clefable or Wigglytuff, they jammed them all in there with the rest of Haymaker, finally starting to cut energy cards down to around 20. Trainer lines were still dictated by what players had access to, hence the absence of heavier counts of Computer Search, Item Finder, and Lass. Two non-cookie cutter versions of Haymaker involve switching out Electabuzz instead of Hitmonchan for Tauros to try and deal big damage with Rampage. The best speculation I have is that this player's meta was devoid of Hitmonchan, and he wanted to punish opposing Electabuzz poking his bull. Another Haymaker cut Electabuzz entirely, replacing the lightning energy with grass and adding three Ponyta with DCEs to try and score big damage on opposing Scythers. Talk about horsing around. Scott Gearhart, one of the great minds of this early era, dominated a room of almost 100 trainers with his potpourri deck, 
which featured three energy types, almost unheard of at the time. His list is unique in that it was basically Haymaker, with an added trio of Mr. Mind to keep the pace of game slow and more easily handle attackers like Wigglytuff. He was definitely onto something with his meta-countering lists, capitalizing on the emerging cookie-cutter Haymaker lists. Using a similar list, Ryan Trong dominated his locals in September, placing in the top two every week that month. Potpourri was on the rise as a dominant force in local scenes, but with many players having limited cards and limited access to results in lists from elsewhere, they continued running what worked, Haymaker. One of the final lists from the base jungle era is an odd take on Haymaker called Tricolor that definitely is as anti-meta as it comes. Running Rattata to counter Mr. Mimes and attackers of all types but water, this player took down a 50-person tournament, preying on unsuspecting players by hitting for weaknesses against all major attackers. In his report, he writes Electabuzz dominated Blastoise, Rattata's resistance took out an Alakazam stall deck, and Magmar easily dealt with Scythers. While we can question some of the cards included, he definitely had a strategy in mind that he executed to a T. After a summer of haymakers, many players were undoubtedly excited for the Fossil expansion, releasing in October of 1999. Success! My first Pokémon fossil! Yay! Gary, Gary, he's the best! Fossil only contained 62 cards, but like Jungle, it featured hollow and non-hollow variants of all rare cards, so it really only added 47 cards to the game. But Fossil marked the milestone of having all original 150 Pokémon in print. Sorry Mew, you'll have to wait just a little bit longer. Though small, Fossil added multiple competitive cards to players' decks. Rain Dance finally reached its peak with the release of two strong, basic water attackers, Articuno and Lapras. Articuno had 70 HP, strong, big damage attacks, and boasted resistance to Hitmonchan. Lapras's water gun attack was essentially a weaker version of Blastoise's Hydro Pump, but finally gave the deck an answer for Mr. Mime other than attacking with Squirtle. Another strong water type was Psyduck, whose headache attack shut down opponents' trainers. In a format with only trainers and no supporters, this was incredibly strong to delay your opponent while setting up your own strategy behind the confused duck. Alakazam received Tentacool, allowing it to move 20 damage a turn to Tentacool before adding Tentacool back to your hand, essentially healing damage right off the board. Haymaker and Potpourri received new toys in Energy Search to seek out the energy type needed and Magmar, another high HP, low cost attacker, whose moves had powerful secondary effects, causing attacks to fail or poison. Maltrace breathed life into the stall archetype. Paired with Chansey, this deck focused on using Wildfire to deck your opponents out before they could take all six prize cards. Fossil also contained some of the strongest powers the game had seen to date. Aerodactyl stopped all Pokemon evolution. Ditto literally became the opposing Pokemon, giving players and judges a headache. Dragonite could switch itself with the active Pokemon from your bench. Gengar could move your opponent's damage counters, and Haunter could avoid attacks altogether with a coin flip. Best of all was Muck, whose power turned off all other powers in play except for Muck's, stopping decks like Raindance in their tracks. Upon Fossil's release, most players opted to keep doing what had been working, and that was playing Haymaker. The first known tournament with Fossil Legal was won by a basic Haymaker deck with a 2-2 Dodrio line included. Finally, the three-headed bird was getting the credit it deserved. Other players moved away from the original Haymaker Trinity to try and use the new Magmar card, probably to try and counter Fireweak Scythers while eroding opposing Wigglytuffs. Ditto variants of Haymaker also started popping up, opting to cut Hitmonchan and play heavy double colorless counts to try and abuse Ditto's ability to make energy attached be energy of any type. 
Tournament reports from October indicate players stuck to what they knew, Raindance and Haymaker, with the occasional Psychic deck thrown in for good measure. But deck building was turned on its head in mid-November, when Mewtwo Strikes Back premiered at box offices and gave moviegoers new promo cards. While three of the four were nothing to write home about, one would change the direction of the game entirely, Mewtwo. Boasting 70 HP, a big damage attack, but more importantly, energy absorption, which allowed the player to recover energy cards from the discard and attach them to it. Mewtwo was the strongest card the game had seen yet. It made it safe to burn energy cards with your discard cost trainers, knowing you would be able to recover them and power up Mewtwo in just one turn. It also weakened energy removal, because the energy taken off could be absorbed right back. Immediately upon release, Scott Gearhart used his iconic Sponge deck, featuring the new Mewtwo to take home a tournament win. Using high counts of Bills and Oaks to plow through his deck, he all but guaranteed he could pull off a turn 1 energy absorption, requiring the opponent to react immediately or risk losing the game. Variants of Sponge started popping up all over the country. Rico Reynes took home a tournament using an aggro psychic version of the deck, focusing on a fast Mewtwo for himself and cards like Lickitung and Mr. Mime to slow down opposing Mewtwo. Notably, this is finally a deck list from 1999 that had under 20 energy cards. People were learning. As Mewtwo continued its assault on the metagame, Haymaker decks started cutting the Psychic Weak Hitmonchan altogether, opting to instead run Electabuzz, Scyther, and Magmar. While some Hitmonchan-based versions still placed, they ceased winning tournaments like they had done earlier in the year. Additionally, a new version of Haymaker emerged, set on running only 8 Pokémon, 12 Energies, and the rest Trainers. That deck was called Insanity because of its rapid play style that was designed to win the game in the early turns. Harkening back to the early days of the game, Phil H. took down a tournament with only Electabuzz and Hitmonchan, running through his deck to last his opponents before jabbing, thundershocking, and thunderpunching them into submission. Likely recognizing the deck's weakness to opposing Scyther, Calvin Jameson opted to run Magmar over Hitmonchan, winning his tournament with the same strategy. Last was just too strong of a card when your opponent hadn't even played a turn yet. Instead of opting to add Mewtwo to the deck, Potpourri continued its anti-meta ways, running Mr. Mime and Magmar to try and slow down early Mewtwo pressure, as well as psychic-resistant attackers like Lickitung and Jigglypuff. While Scott Gearhart had moved on from his initial creation to his new Sponge deck, Ryan Trong continued refining potpourri and dominating his local scene. Though diminished, Raindance was still a force in the meta, with Brady Watkins winning a tournament with the deck. Finally cutting Wartortle in favor of Breeder, this list focused on what Blastoise did best, getting a fast turtle into play and flooding your Articunos and Lapras with water energy. Wigglytuff was also still around, thanks in part to its psychic resistance. Ned M's list is proof that players were finally starting to understand deck building, moving away from 20 energy and running more important trainers like Item Finder. This was thanks in no small part to websites and magazines like the legendary Pojo, finally getting up and running for competitive players. Though still without Lickitung, Stahl started notching results in local scenes, capitalizing on Chansey's resistance to the Psychic-type Mewtwo. Winning back-to-back -back weeks at locals, this energy-heavy build focused on milling your opponent with Maltrace, sitting behind Mewtwo using Barrier and hitting your opponent with a barrage of strong defensive trainers. You have to remember in these days, Fossils gave up no prizes for being KO'd. Clefairy Doll also did not count as a KO for prize purposes. With players likely not aware how to play around stall yet, and being used to oaking for whatever they needed, it's easy to see how this archetype could run rampant on an unaware player base. The fabled Cleaner deck also popped up during this time. Cleaner focused on using Lickitung, Magmar, Coughing, and Tangela for early pressure while setting up an Arcanine behind them to clean up the board. The deck was not top tier, struggling with the presence of gust of wind and energy removals to slow it down. 
but it's easy to see how an unsuspecting player might overlook the Arcanine on the bench, focusing on the coughing whittling away at its attackers until it was too late. It's definitely a unique concept, and it seems to have taken some players by surprise, performing well for the deck's creator. In January of 2000, players were finally treated to the 151st card at their local leagues, finally obtaining the promo card Mew. While well, no doubt players were excited to complete their Pokedexes, Mew was a long-awaited counter to Mewtwo players, dealing 10 times the number of energy on the opposing Pokémon. After an energy absorption, all Mew needed to KO the psychic weak Mewtwo was a plus power. Following its release, it was an immediate inclusion in Scott's sponge deck that he used to once again take down his locals. I am curious as to why he chose to run one gambler, however. Players began transitioning away from potpourri decks that were popular earlier in the format, moving to sponge variants that capitalized on the new Mew card, with many running heavy counts of ditto. Wigglytuff started creeping back into decks, making it into late-stage potpourri variants as well as Haymaker decks, and started to recapture some of its earlier success. Undoubtedly, players discovered that Ditto's resistance to Mewtwo and its ability to use DCEs as two psychic energy was the best way to counter sponge decks. This list was used in the last recorded tournament of the base fossil era to win the whole event. Focusing solely on fighting types to deal with Electabuzz and colorless attackers to beat back opposing Mewtwo, clearly this proved too much for his opponents to overcome. While this list is perhaps not viable given what we know now of the base fossil format, it's definitely one of the best I've seen while going through old tournament reports, so I have to give credit where credit's due. Up to this point, the only set to be released in 2000 was Base Set 2, a reprint of many of the original cards from Base, Jungle, and Fossil. By April, players were clamoring for change, and with the arrival of April showers, so too blew the winds of change. A new expansion was on the horizon, and it would set the stage for one of the most degenerate formats the game would ever witness. The game was about to get disruptive. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed learning more about the first year of the game and seeing the deck lists players actually used during that time, consider liking and subscribing so that we know you like this kind of content. We're looking forward to presenting more on the years of Retro Pokemon and are really excited for the next installment. This is the Ruby Retro Historian, signing off.